to Behind the Shadows. My name is Susan Finelli, and I am your host and author of Behind the Shadows, a program where we go behind the shadows of what meets the eye. This evening, we will be going behind the shadows of avoiding employee discrimination lawsuits, what the employer should know. And I am happy to be welcoming back Richard Cohen. Richard first joined us to discuss discrimination in the workplace last year, and he's joining us tonight to continue our discussion. Richard Cohen is a partner in the New York office of the national law firm of Fox Rothschilds. Richard possesses 35 years of experience litigating, arbitrating, and resolving complex employment, corporate, and commercial disputes. He is a trusted advisor to business owners and human resource departments, both in the United States and internationally. His clients range from small businesses to multi-corporations which need employment and human resources services. Richard has tried dozens of cases in all of the courts in this area and has conducted numerous arbitrations that have involved employment-related matters including discrimination, <laughs> harassment, restricted covenants, business non-competes, and trade secret and confidential business protection. Richard has also counseled business owners and human resource professionals with anywhere ranging from 5,000 to 50,000 employees. Richard, welcome back to Behind the Shadows. Thank you, Susan. Very happy to be here. It's my pleasure to welcome you back tonight. And just to get our, our viewers to catch up a little bit, last time you were here, we focused just on in discrimination in the workplace. And tonight we're going to focus on how employers can avoid these lawsuits. So maybe you can bring us up to speed. What has happened in the last year in, in this area? Well, in the last year, a lot has happened. Um, the employment law area is a, a fast moving area, even faster now than ever before because the workplace is a microcosm of, of society. Um, all the tensions, all the diversity, all the faults um, of society are replicated in the workplace. People don't check their gender, their race, their religion at the door. They come to the workplace, the workplace becomes a cauldron uh, of all sorts of personal and societal issues. And that's reflected, and it has been reflected in the last year, in all sorts of lawsuits, all sorts of case decisions coming down, and legislation um, from uh, the empowerment, I guess that's the best word, of uh, gay, lesbian, transgendered people um, by virtue of the president's various um, directives and various uh, EEOC and case law initiatives um, to uh, all sorts of uh, different lawsuits involving religion involving age, involving pregnancy status. It's, it's changing rapidly. Okay. Now, I understand that you are the founder and editor of the, an employment blog for your firm, and it's one of the most read blogs, I think, in the United States. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, we, we, uh, we have thousands of readers. Um, it's called uh, the Fox Rothschild Employment Discrimination Report. Uh, we like to keep it uh, fresh and moving, so we, we do blog entries just about every day, sometimes times, three or four times a day, and we tap many different feeds, so we're pretty much on the cutting edge of knowing what's going on in the law, and, uh, and people really respond. They, we have a very large readership now. How can our viewers access your blog? Well, they could just uh, uh, go online to Fox Rothschild and check out the blog, just punch in blogs. We have 30 blogs or more in our, in our mm -hmm. firm, or they could just uh, Google Employment Discrimination Report, and we're number one or two. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Now, I understand uh, that employment discrimination cases are on the rise, and uh, I'm assuming that it's attributed to what you've just discussed in, in the opening of the show, but is there any particular area where you see reoccurring lawsuits over and over again? Well, you know, the, the EEOC, mm -hmm. which is the federal agency that is that was set up to handle complaints, handle charges of discrimination, try to mediate and conciliate and resolve such charges and investigate such charges, mm -hmm. they came out with statistics that uh, show that last year there were over 100,000 charges filed in the United States with wow. that agency, yeah. largest ever. Um, what's on the rise uh, is, 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 is certainly no surprise. 
it's a uh, still gender based and race based mm -hmm. um, charges um, and charges of retaliation. We talked about that I think at the last session yeah. when I was here. Mm -hmm. um, that hasn't changed in terms of the which charges are 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 growing in, in number. Mm -hmm. Now I, I read somewhere that the charges are growing uh, rapidly among young employees. And why do you think that is? Is it age? Uh, is uh, you know I, I had read that it was the older because they want to bring the younger people in to pay them less. But now I'm reading just the reverse. And why do you think that is? Well, again, people people in this this society they they know their rights a lot more than they used to. Mm -hmm. People are educated about that. The the workforce is particularly savvy uh, when it comes to what their rights are. In New York State, for example, mm -hmm. an employee is an employee at will. Bill, which means that without a contract, without a collective bargaining agreement, an employee can pretty much be hired and fired at the discretion of the employer. Uh, the only break on that is, are the civil rights laws. The, the Title VII is the, the omnibus, the main civil rights law, the Age Discrimination Act, mm -hmm. the disability laws. Those are the only real breaks on the unfettered discretion of the employer to terminate someone or, or impose some adverse employment action and um, and as as people learn that as employees they don't have that many rights mm -hmm. uh, and they have disputes yeah. or they're angry or they're disgruntled they turn to the only recourse legally that they have which are the civil rights laws right right and but is that all encompassing I mean the civil rights laws so I was reading that um, the, these startup companies they have kind of like a loser culture so maybe you can talk to us about that and then would that translate into an, an EOC sure, sure. Um, with, with the with the advent of the dot com companies mm -hmm. and the smaller startups um, and and the fact that uh, the political dynamics are such today that the entrepreneurial spirit is riding high. Um, there are a lot of smaller companies, companies with 5, 10, 15, 20 employees. Those companies can't afford to have a human resources department mm -hmm. or a personnel director right. or anyone in-house who really is familiar with the laws. Understands the laws. Exactly. Right. Uh, a large company, had they have a whole department charged mm -hmm. with that. And when that happens, when, when the only person who's in charge of compliance with the laws is the administrative assistant or a trusted clerk or perhaps the the owner's uh, personal accountant mm -hmm. there's bound to be friction in the workplace harassment taking place uh, no one is aware of what can and can't be done or should and shouldn't be done mm -hmm. and it becomes just a, again a, a sort of a free-for-all well how do you find as you know I, I do uh, management consulting and I've had a clients come to me and and, you know, so-and-so told me that Mr. X on Facebook is, you know, talking badly about the firm. And they want me to go on these people's Facebook pages to see what is happening. What is the recourse for the, for the uh, employer? Do they, do they have a case? And, and can I sue the employer if I'm the employee and I find out that you checked my Facebook page and I said, well, gee, what a scoundrel and I hate working there and et cetera, et cetera. And then you fire me. Can I sue you for that or can I sue you for just even looking at my Facebook page? Well, the, the beauty of our society is you can sue anyone for anything. <laughs> There's, there's really no. Is there no a way. case? Is the it, question. Does it, does it have any merit? That's, does it that's have absolutely any true. That's exactly. absolutely true. Well, you, you raise an interesting point because one of the cutting edges of employment law is the social media, mm -hmm. is the Facebook page. Perhaps you've read that um, legislation has been introduced in the U.S. Congress because there are cases now, and we're seeing more and more cases, where employers are insisting on obtaining the password. Can they Facebook. do that? Is that legal? I'm, well, I, I read that in the paper and I said, how could that be? Some states make it illegal. Most states are considering mm -hmm. uh, making it illegal. Again, there was legislation introduced in the Senate. Uh, I think Senator uh, Schumer, among others, wanted to introduce this mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to prevent an employer mm -hmm. from having access to someone's password. But short of that, nothing's stopping someone, your employer, for example, or anyone else right. from accessing your Facebook page and reading about it, which is why an employee is well advised not to put anything on a Facebook page mm -hmm. or, for that matter, in an email mm -hmm. that they don't want 
someone to read, and such as their employer. You'd be surprised how many employees put these terrible statements about their employers on, on their Facebook page. No, I, I would not be surprised. No, I've seen enough of that. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. I was surprised. I mean, I was surprised when I went on, and you know, and, and he, he sucks, and this is terrible, and carrying on, and I'm saying, well, these people, like, what is wrong with them? Right, <laughs> right. And that's, again, that's a cutting edge because there's nothing to prevent someone mm -hmm. from, from saying whatever they want on their Facebook page, but there's also nothing to prevent the employer from saying, that's it, you're out. I don't want someone either bad-mouthing me or my company mm -hmm. who works for me, or I don't want someone who's a representative of my company acting so foolish on a social media outlet. Mm -hmm. And again, unless the civil rights laws are invoked, unless you, the employee, are, are doing something uh, that leads your employer to fire you because of your gender or your race or your religion, there's nothing stopping the employer mm -hmm. from firing you simply because you're on Facebook. Well, let's talk a little bit about employer rights because, you know, we, we've spent a lot of time in, in your last segment with us and, and, and now about employee rights. What are the employer rights and what protections do they have? Well, you know, in, in our blog, we spend a lot of time reading, synthesizing, analyzing the latest developments in the law. And rather than, than taking a particular position, we believe, I believe as, as the editor, that educating the employer and the employee as to what the law is and how to comply with it is the best preventative uh, against disputes arising and therefore lawsuits commencing. Uh, an employer is always advised, and this is this is what we tell everyone, and we we pound it out on our on our blog. If you if you read it, that they should be compliant. They should know the law. They should start off by having a clear, consistent policy. A, a, a policy manual, an employee manual of some sort, that tells the employees what is allowed in the workplace, what's not allowed. Mm -hmm. uh, such manuals contain provisions, for example, uh, that we recommend uh, of zero tolerance in the workplace. The employer lets the worker know that we will not tolerate any sort of discrimination, any sort of harassment, be it sexual harassment or harassment based on any other category, right. race, religion, etc. That is the first thing. Mm -hmm. that, that should be in every handbook. Right. Every employee should know that. Every employee should know where to turn and who to make a claim to or a complaint to should they experience harassment or discrimination. Right. And that's where it just starts. That's the beginning. And to explore every harassment uh, complaint because I've been in situations where uh, an employee made a harassment complaint and the employee says, oh, no, that's just how he is, you know. Right. And then they wind up in court. Right. Well, that that in, that in, that example you give is is common, and that invites a lawsuit. Right. That invites a lawsuit. Um, yeah, understand that the employment laws are designed to make the employer responsible for what goes on in the workplace, mm -hmm. even if the employer didn't do it. Right. If the, an employee A is harassed by employee B. The employer is responsible if the employer is told about it and does nothing, mm -hmm. which is why employers are always advised to take every complaint seriously, to investigate every complaint. It, it could get complicated, yeah. the larger of the workplace too, uh, but to do a proper investigation and to make sure that that if if the charge is borne out, that there are remedies, that there's that the employee who brought the charge knows that something will be done about it. Right. Short of that, the, the employer is literally buying a lawsuit. What what happens when and, and you read it periodically uh, that you know some employee or a former employee comes in and shoots somebody and then the employer gets sued. And what is the obligation to find and do a background check to see if there was any mental instability or priors or, or whatever? Well, th that, that sort of skirts the issue of discrimination law, but in a very important way. Um, if someone, if an employer leaves the workplace unattended, unprotected, unsecured so that someone can come off the street, mm -hmm. be it an ex-employee or a stranger, and hurt someone, just by virtue of, of the old common law, the employer could presumably be liable mm -hmm. for not protecting or not making sure that the employers are protected there on his or her premises. Right. What's, what's interesting about this is that there are issues of, of what an employer can do 
to ensure that the workplace is safe mm -hmm. and to ensure that the people that he or she hires right. are not likely to commit violence or right. to, or, to, or to harass, and some of the cutting edge issue cutting edge issues now are how far can an employer go to investigate someone's criminal background? That is probably the most important cutting edge issue right now uh, in in the national scene. And how far can they go? Well, they can they can go pretty far, but the EEOC has just recently, within the last month or six weeks, <clears throat> come down with a guidance as to how far you can go in investigating someone's arrest record or conviction record. Mm -hmm. The EEOC, again, charged with making sure that employers comply with the discrimination laws, um, is very sensitive to this issue and for 20 or 30 years has had guidance mm -hmm. uh, as to what an employer can or can't do, but it's been very sketchy. Now they decided they going to make it more concrete and make it uh, more understandable. Well, as with any bureaucracy, what they think will be more understandable creates perhaps more confusion. issues and confusion. <laughs> confusion. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, and confusion. a lot of employers call up, what do we do? What can we do? What can we ask? Mm -hmm. But it's clear that, that an employer, number one, can ask questions about someone's conviction record because if someone's convicted, it's presumptive evidence that they committed the act that was attributable to them. Mm -hmm. And if that act and whatever it is that they, they did to commit that crime is something that is incompatible with that particular workplace, the employer can, in fact, not refuse to hire, hire that person. But employers are advised to make sure that whatever they ask is job-related. Okay. It's job-related. So that, for example, um, uh, if someone has a conviction or even an arrest for assault, for for child molestation, to take an extreme example, right. uh, an employer, of course, has the right to ask if they run a daycare center, right. if they have such a conviction. Right. Clearly, that's job-related. Now, what about volunteers? And, and what is coming to my mind is, is in the forefront of, of the news these days is the George Zimmerman case. He's a volunteer security guard or whatever, right? So what happens if, a vo if, if we, bring, we bring on a volunteer, we're a nonprofit, we bring on a volunteer, and, a vol and this volunteer goes on the rampage? What is what is the responsibility of this uh, nonprofit organization? Well, that 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 is not an easy question to answer. Uh, again, as with the stranger entering the workplace and, mm -hmm. and attacking or assaulting one of the employees, this really implicates the common law or the criminal law of the various various states. Um, if if someone is brought on and commits a crime, well, it it depends, as you said earlier, whether the employer. Uh, was negligent in mm -hmm. hiring that person and not delving into their background. In the case of the Zimmerman case that you mentioned here, I'm not sure that the civil rights laws are implicated here. They, they may very well be. Mm -hmm. um, the investigation is ongoing. Uh, I certainly have no direct knowledge or right. input as to, or, or feedback as to what's taking place and whether race was a factor, mm -hmm. although some people certainly feel it was. If that's the case, that changes the entire focus. I'm just wondering if, if his, if uh, the the, uh, the victim's parents would have a case against the, the organization that brings on these uh, security people. These volunteer cops, well, whatever they are. That's a very good question, and I think the plaintiff's bar would probably say yes and put up an advertisement. <laughs> okay. So uh, a minute ago, we, we talked a little bit about confusion, and there's something that I find in my practice that employers and employees are very confused about, and perhaps we can, uh, we can straighten it out a little bit. Federal law says one thing. State's law says something entirely different. Federal law rules, state floor rules, what what over in, over entwines what what works? Well, it, the, the federal law, uh, as a general rule, and I'd say pretty much virtually all the time, supersedes any state law or local law that's in conflict with it. Mm -hmm. That's embedded in our system of federalism that goes back to the Constitution. The federal law is is preeminent and and that's what governs. Um, frequently in the employment law area, there are 
federal laws, state laws, and municipal laws. There's a New York City a human rights law, there's a state human rights law, and there's a federal set of, of human rights laws, the civil rights laws. And to the extent that they're not incompatible, Frequently we find, and in New York it's the, certainly the case, that the state law is more liberal and the city law is more liberal still than the state law. And as long as it doesn't, again, contravene the federal law, it can supplement it, and it often does. Mm -hmm. Employees have greater rights under the city law mm -hmm. than they do under the state or the federal. For example, under federal law, and this is also a cutting edge of the law, under right. federal law, gay, lesbian, transgendered people do not have, are not a protected class, while in New York State, New York City, they are. So that, that rules. In New York State, New York City, that would rule. Well, or does, you, you have three sets of rights. The right. federal law would just, not, would, would just not provide you that right, but the city and the state law come in and supplement it. And so does that make a difference in the type of lawsuit one brings? Frequently not. You just sue for all three different laws. Okay. All right. Let's talk a little bit about um, discrimination, really targeted discrimination. I know you had given me an example if for, to take the police test, right? right? If you're a 5'5 five five or, or under 5'5, under five five, you, you're not eligible, correct? Well, I'm not sure if it's 5'5 five, five or what. Well, whatever but, whatever but we the had talk, threshold is. We had talked is. earlier about, uh, about uh, what's called, under the rubric, disparate impact. Disparate impact, right. Which is to be distinguished from mm -hmm. um, disparate treatment. Mm -hmm. I can't treat you differently as an employer because of your race, your color, your religion, your gender. I can't actively treat you differently. Right. Um, disparate impact is a little harder to comprehend sometimes. It involves, for example, a test or some criteria which is facially neutral, mm -hmm. facially not discriminatory, Correct. such as I'm running a fire department and I say anyone under 5'2 cannot be hired. And my reason is that you have to be a certain stature to be able to carry the heavy fire hoses. Right. But that, that particular criteria, which facially or on its face doesn't have any discriminatory intent. Mm -hmm. It wasn't meant to discriminate. It, it was the farthest thing from the minds of those who promulgated this test. It may have, it may have a disparate impact on those who are under 5'2", who have the immutable characteristic, for example, of being female. Mm -hmm. There are more people under 5'2", who are female than male. I see. Mm -hmm. So the impact on females is greater than males. So that this disparate impact might uh, uh, confer upon females as a gender uh, a right to sue. So it kind of tips the scales. You could say that. Yeah, it tips you could the say scales. That. And there are there are a lot of again a, 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 a very a very cutting edge of the law now is and it hasn't even been been clearly uh, opined upon by even the EEOC, which again is charged with mm -hmm. setting the standards, if you will, in, in nationwide. Is can someone can an employer inquire about the credit history? of an applicant, mm -hmm. that what could be more facially neutral than someone's credit history? Right. Except that a lot of experts have testified in Congress, have testified before the EEOC, that looking at someone's credit history will have a disparate impact mm -hmm. upon those who are poorer, who have a poorer credit history, naturally. And who are the people in our society who tend to be poorer and have a credit history that's not so sterling. It tends to be people of color. Right. So therefore, there's a disparate impact upon people of color. And the EEOC is looking into that and seeing if there's some way that inquiring into the credit history would could be done in such a way that it doesn't impact people because of their race or gender or nationality. I, I wonder how that can be done because at the, when you peel that onion, that's what you get down to. You're absolutely right. It might not be able to be done. Right, uh, and, right. But even the EEOC is wrestling with that. Mm -hmm. So we, we'll, we'll know soon, but, it, but whatever they, they come down with, you can be sure will be challenged in the court. Is obesity a protected class? The answer, the answer is, is no. Um, 
for the most part. I think one state has appearance. I think Michigan might be the only state that has appearance, mm -hmm. grooming appearance perhaps, or uh, beauty, however that's defined, or size or body mass index as a protected class. But uh, almost every jurisdiction does not. But again, I have to warn any employer out there that the EEOC and plaintiff's lawyers look very carefully on whether whether using obesity as a criterion not to hire someone does not have a disparate impact mm -hmm. against people who are obese and may be obese in greater numbers based upon their race or their national origin. Mm -hmm. And there are statistics to show that too, that various nationalities, various races have different body mass index. So mm -hmm. if it has a disparate impact upon someone of a particular color, let's say, that might violate the law. Not the fact that they're obese, but the fact that there's a disparate impact upon a group of people class. in a protected class a protected who class. might ha have greater incidence of obesity than other classes. Other classes. I recently read, which I find it hard to believe in, in you know, the year 2012, but there are so many uh, discrimination cases for maternity, which I'm surprised. The, the, the most interesting one is lactation. Yes. Can, can a woman who has given birth, can she breastfeed in the workplace? A lot of interesting cases uh, coming down now. Maybe next time we can talk about that. Absolutely. Richard, I, I can't believe we're getting cued that we're running out of time. We have so much more to talk about. I want to thank you for coming and My visiting pleasure. us again. And I do hope you come and visit us another time. I'd be happy time. to do. I enjoy this. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank you, our audience, for tuning in tonight. If you have any questions uh, about uh, employers avoiding law suits, uh, feel free to check out uh, Richard Cohen's blog uh, or his uh, website. And if there's a topic you would like us to discuss, you can contact me at Susan at BehindTheShadows.com. If you've missed any of our shows, you can uh, go on my website at BehindTheShadows.com, click on Public Access Television. And until next time, remember, the brightest light shines behind the shadows. Thank you so much. It was a great this, show. That was good. I enjoyed, I enjoyed that. That's it. Well, you'll have to figure what else you can come and talk about. Look, I do, look, whatever question, I mean, this, it's endless.